Welcome back to Beyond the Heart. I'm your host, Dr. Nisa Goldberg. And in this segment, we're going to discuss fibroids. A new study on fibroids showed that many women are waiting a very long time for treatment, and they're confused about what options they have. To help relieve the confusion this morning on Dr. Radio is Dr. Elizabeth A. Stewart, who's calling in. She's professor of obstetrics and gynecology and chair of the Division of Reproductive Endocrinology at the Mayo Clinic in Mayo Medical, Mayo, and she's um, on the faculty of the Mayo Medical School in Rochester, Minnesota. Welcome to the show, Dr. Stewart. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, we're excited to have you. How's the weather in Rochester? It's actually lovely. Yeah. No signs of winter yet. No, that's right around the corner. That's good. It's kind of a little chilly out here in New York City and a very gray day. Um, but I'm thrilled that you're joining us. I'm friendly with a lot of your colleagues in the Division of Cardiology at the Mayo Clinic. Yes. Uh, and um, what I want, you know, first before we get into this study, I thought you'd tell our listeners a little bit more about what fibroids really are. Okay, I'd love to. Uh, fibroids are non-cancerous tumors uh, of the uterus uh, that uh, cause a huge variety of symptoms. Uh, that they are the major reason uh, why women have heavy menstrual bleeding. And this can be very severe. Uh, women can have uh, seven, eight, nine, um, up to 12 days of menstrual bleeding a wow. month or have such heavy bleeding that they need to change protection uh, less than every hour. So you can imagine trying to work and have um, a substantial bleeding problem like that. I bet they also feel weak and tired because they become anemic from losing blood. Absolutely, and, and uh, you know, it's not infrequent that you see a woman in the emergency room that needs a transfusion because of heavy menstrual bleeding. Or I've seen women who've gone through a whole evaluation of uh, for anemia, including a colonoscopy, before somebody said, well, wait a minute, how heavy are your periods, and could it be fibroids? Uh, wow. So, uh, you know, making sure that women and medical professionals know the impact of fibroids is critical. Right, because the knee-jerk response when an adult has an anemia and what's considered iron deficiency anemia is that the knee-jerk response is to do a colonoscopy because you think it's GI bleeding. Absolutely, but again, but it's wrong. <laughs> a young woman and particularly a young African-American woman, fibroids are probably much, much more likely. So we talked about some of the symptoms, you know, they get anemia, um, what, what else do they, um, and, and prolonged menstrual periods, do they get abdominal pain or pelvic pain? Um, they, uh, women with fibroids do have abdominal pain and pelvic pain, uh, but it's, it's not the kind of severe doubling over pain people think about. It's more discomfort, distension. Uh, it's more like women experience when they're pregnant. The uterus uh, with fibroids can become quite enlarged so wow. that a woman is walking around with a uterus that is permanently the size of a five- or six-month pregnancy. And so that um, has impacts on her bladder function, her bowel function, uh, the presence of back pain, and um, the whole way her clothes fit and her abdominal contour. So um, those are big symptoms for many Huge. women. And, and you know, we mentioned earlier about who's at risk. You mentioned particularly African-American women. But what else puts women at risk for fibroids? Well, all women are really at risk for okay. fibroids. Uh, the estimate is that the, the your lifetime chance of having fibroids is about 70 to 80 percent. And about 25% of all women have fibroids plus some fibroid-related symptoms. So uh, as one of my colleagues says, it's the most common orphan disease that he's ever heard of. That's, that's right, because, uh, you know, so many people um, are, are not, you know, having the symptoms. Maybe it's underdiagnosed. People are not t getting getting um, care for the fibroids. I'm going to reach out to our listeners and are you confused about what to do about your fibroids? Well, you can stop the confusion today on Dr. Radio. If you want to call in and ask your questions, 877-NYU-DOCS, 877-698-3627, or you can email us 
at docs at SiriusXM.com. Dr. Elizabeth Stewart from the Mayo Clinic is on the phone with us, enlightening us about the new treatments and some of the reasons why women are not getting the care that they need. So let's get back to this. Um, why, why is there such a delay, Dr. Stewart? I really wish I understood. Um, I think that there are a couple of issues. I think that, uh, first of all, uh, some women are hesitant to discuss such personal issues. Right. To uh, come in and complain about heavy menstrual bleeding is not something that feels comfortable to many women. Um, I think, secondly, um, that women uh, tend to accept this as their lot in life, that, uh, you know, that they just have to uh, deal with their periods and that talking about it doesn't make sense. I think other women actually do go and try to talk about it, uh, but uh, they aren't heard or understood. Um, and that, uh, you know, many times women will say, well, I have heavy periods, and their provider will say, well, yeah, but you're not anemic, so what? Uh, and, so, you know, that uh, many women don't get the follow-up questions like, you know, what's your worst day like? Or how many days of bleeding are you having a month? Or are you having to bring an extra change of, of clothing with you to right. work because you're, you're having uh, problems where uh, you're staining your clothing? Well, and, so I and think also, there are many reasons. And also people are told, you know, particularly I see obviously as a cardiologist um, a lot of postmenopausal women and um, some of them are just told that by their doctors like it will go away after menopause but well, for, for many, many. The, 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 if they're huge they don't right so <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right that, that many of us are taught that menopause is a cure for fibroids and if your only symptom is heavy menstrual bleeding that's true if you don't have periods, you don't have heavy periods. It's true. <laughs> but, but because of the, the size, many women get shrinkage. But if your uterus is the size of a uh, six- or seven-month pregnancy, um, they're not going to disappear at menopause. They may shrink. They may soften. Uh, but you're absolutely right. Uh, there are rare women that need to go on and have surgery after menopause uh, because of persistently large fibroids. Yeah, and, and you know, um, Dr. Stewart, there are some people who are waiting to, to ask their questions, so I'm going to welcome Angela from New York. Hi, Angela, Great. how can we help you? Hi, um, I'm perimenopausal, and I have a fibroid that is just under the size of my uterus, and I find that the only problems I really think that I have with it is when I ovulate, it's like TMSing, bloated, all symptoms, and then my period comes, and it's so it's a little bit different here and there because of time menopause, but um, I also have a retroverted uterus. So I find that when I have ovulation and my period, I get the pushes on my bladder and then I have incontinence symptoms. So I'm wondering if I would have it removed, would that have any impact on incontinence? Dr. Stewart, I think we're, we're losing some connections. So did, did you hear some of that? Yeah, I believe I did. Okay. Uh, let me start to answer it, and if I left out any important parts, uh, let me know. Uh, so I think you bring up a great question, uh, is how do you manage fibroids as you approach menopause? And it sounds like uh, the caller also brought in an important um, facet of fibroids is that there are changes throughout the menstrual cycle, so that some women may have symptoms during their periods and then another peak of symptoms as they um, approach uh, the time of ovulation. So yes, it is um, reasonable to have a variation of symptoms along uh, the course of the menstrual cycle. And many women actually do have an increase in their symptoms as they approach the perimenopause because that's when your hormones are uh, more variable. You kind of are on more of a hormonal roller coaster so that one day you have very high levels of, of estrogen and progesterone and then a couple of days later it goes back down to a very low level. Um, I think the real advice I'd have for the caller is that the alternatives to hysterectomy work best for women in the perimenopausal transition. So not 
all women need to have surgery before okay. the fibroids. And certainly not all women need to have a hysterectomy. So there are medications that can help ease some of these symptoms um, uh, for the woman that's transitioning to menopause. And there's some minimally invasive interventions that can help as well. So I'd advise her to be talking to a physician that can give her a full range of fibroid options and not just hysterectomy or nothing. Okay, thanks for calling in, Angela. We're going to move on to Tammy from Utah. Hi, Tammy. Hi. Welcome. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. In 19, or 2001, I was 42 and developed fibroids, and my doctor told me that I needed to have a hysterectomy. If I waited longer than a month, it would be too late. She couldn't go in vaginally. Um, I trusted my doctor, and so I did not get a second opinion and went ahead and had the hysterectomy, left my ovaries, and since then... I have gained 70 pounds and have zero sex drive. I've tried everything to fix that. Nothing has worked, including testosterone injections. And I just want to um, tell people that they need to get a second opinion. If your doctor immediately recommends hysterectomy and says there's no other option, I should have gotten a second opinion, but I did trust my doctor and thought, well, she knows what she's talking about. And here I am, and, and that's one of my biggest regrets is that I did not get a second opinion prior to having the surgery. So and that's all I had was fibroids. I never had pain. I did have a distended uterus and a lot of gas. But that's about it. Okay. You know, uh, Dr. Stewart, um, obviously second opinions are an option, but let's, um, I want people to meet people's expectations. If somebody sa- says, um, I don't want to have an, a hysterectomy, what are some of the options that there are now, specific options uh, for the yeah. fibroids? Uh, I think that's a great question. So um, the Options for uh, treatment depend on your symptoms. So if you're having just heavy menstrual bleeding, there's a variety of medications, everything from birth control pills to a hormone-containing IUD uh, to a non-steroidal drug that you take just during your heavy bleeding days. Um, uh, to more powerful medications that um, uh, can suppress the ovaries and kind of put you in a short-term menopause. There's also some minimally invasive strategies for some women with heavy menstrual bleeding uh, where you can do the surgery inside the uterus. So you don't need any um, abdominal incisions. It's the day surgery procedure. Is that, end so of the, uh, is that the ablation procedure? Ablation is one of them, um, and ablation works for all women because it really um, – uh, just destroys the uterine lining. So even if you have fibroids, you don't have the menstrual bleeding associated with it. But there's a second procedure called a hysteroscopic myomectomy that deals very nicely with fibroids that are hiding on the inside of the uterus. So, uh, and those are the women who have really horrendous bleeding. Those are the ladies okay. who come in and ha- say have they, they have nine days of heavy menstrual bleeding. So all of those are options if bleeding is your only problem. And now we have good alternatives to hysterectomy for women with um, both uh, what I call bulk symptoms, symptoms related to the size of the fibroids. Okay. So whether it's an orange size or a grapefruit size or um, uh, even rarely bigger fibroids, uh, that there are minimally invasive surgeries. Um, there's a procedure called uterine artery embolization uh, that's a day surgery procedure uh, where there's um, often an overnight recovery period, but something that gets you back to work within um, a week. Oh, and that's great. There's a, 
there's a new option um, called focused ultrasound surgery that's actually the first in a new generation of non-invasive surgeries where there's no probe or catheter put into the body but powerful x-rays go through the abdominal wall and into the fibroid uh, destroying it um, with um, uh, heat and um, in that case uh, women are able to go home that afternoon and be able to go back to work within a day or two so we've come a long way absolutely it's it's an amazing change over the course of my career yeah thanks for calling in Tammy we're going to welcome Leta from Virginia Leta Lata yeah, Lata. Lata. So, oh, thank, thank you so much for taking my call. Uh, sure. I really appreciate it. I have a couple of questions, Doctor. One about regarding my daughter, who is 15 and a half, and one for me. Uh, first, I'll do my daughter. She had very heavy periods, which lasted for more than 10 days, uh, right from the time she got her puberty when she was 13, and. Uh, this year and last year, around March, um, she had a period which lasted for almost 32 days, and she lost a lot of blood, very heavy period, very painful, and uh, she was put on birth control pills. She is on generous FE right now, and she's on iron supplements. My question is, do you think I should worry if she has fibroids uh, at this age, or... Um, is it uh, normal for uh, girls this age to go through cycles like this? I'm also PCOS, and I know my mom had fibroids, and she had her uterus removed, I think, when she was um, close to her 50s. Wow. Well, what a what a, a, a strong family history. And uh, <laughs> both as a, as a mom and a doctor, I understand how you feel that uh, the goal... Of, of all of our work is not only to develop better treatment for fibroids, uh, but to try to prevent fibroids because uh, there are families just like yours where uh, over two or three generations, you know, women have had problems and then you have a young woman who's having severe problems. Um, there are three things I'm thinking about for your daughter. The first thing is that uh, uh, young women can have some irregularity in their periods um, as they start to ovulate regularly. So um, it can be that this is just a problem as she's starting her periods um, and it will get better. But given your family history, I would say it's worth um, uh uh, having her uh, seen by a gynecologist, and there are gynecologists that, that specialize in adolescent medicine, uh, so that it's pretty traumatic for a young woman to be taken to uh, a regular gynecologist who uh, doesn't understand some of the unique issues. Um, the second thing I would be thinking about is if she's really having heavy menstrual periods and developing anemia, um, at a young age, that makes her more likely to have a bleeding disorder, uh, that there's some evidence that the women that end up getting transfusions as adolescents may have something uh, going on with, with their blood clotting system that may make them more prone to develop um, uh, heavy menstrual bleeding requiring transfusion. But I think the third question is, could she be developing something like fibroids um, at an early age? And I think that that's been a real change in our thinking over the past uh, decade, that I was taught that women develop fibroids in uh, their late 30s and early 40s. But there are women that do develop fibroids in their 20s and probably even their teens, and we're just not looking. Um, what promotes so I, the fibroids? To develop. I'm sorry? What what causes the fibroids to develop? Well that that's the million dollar question. I know. Nobody so we still haven't we still haven't figured that out. No, well we we haven't really cared to figure it out until recently. I think, I think that, that's that, right. <laughs> I think women are demanding better uh, attention and I think yeah. we need to understand 
all of the contributing factors. It does have something to do with genetics. Okay. Um, and we clearly know that it runs in families and um, uh, so that that's important. Uh, but I think there's increasing yeah. evidence that um, environmental factors like diet, like weight, uh, like um, use of contraceptives uh, can be helpful. But the good news is that it seems like many hormonal contraceptives protect against fibroids. I think That's many women many women worry that, gee, if I take birth control pills, is this going to set me up for problems later on? But there's some evidence that birth control pills or progestin-only contraceptives like Depo-Provera actually decrease your risk of fibroids over a lifetime. That's really interesting. Thanks for calling in, Lata. For those of you who are just joining us, it's all about fibroids in this segment, and joining us by phone is Dr. Elizabeth Stewart, who is Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Chair of the Division of Reproductive Endocrinology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. We're taking your calls at 877-NYU-DOCS, 877-698-3627, or you can email us at docs at SiriusXM.com. We're going to welcome Melody from Georgia. Hi, Melody. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Sure. How can we help I'm not you? calling about fibroids. I'm calling about endometriosis. Um, my granddaughter of 19 had laparoscopic surgery when she was 15, and they removed as much endometriosis as they could. But a complicating factor is that her right ovary and colon are adhesed together. And so that was where the bulk of the endometriosis was, and they didn't feel like they could tackle that. She has since seen several specialists, and no one has wanted to do surgery. And because of a factor two multigenerational deficiency, she cannot take hormones, not even progesterone, because it contains a risk of blood clotting. Okay, Dr. And, Stewart? Yeah, I, yeah, I think endometriosis is a is another important disease of women that is not well understood and that causes significant uh, problems for women across their reproductive lifespan. Um, I but think yeah, that... This is, I had it, had to have a hysterectomy. Her mother had it, had to have a hysterectomy. She has it. She doesn't want to have a hysterectomy, and we don't want her to. So, so <laughs> Absolutely. let's, let's um, just, uh, we have just a few minutes left. So, Dr. Stewart, what are options for people with endometriosis um, these days? Well, uh, again, uh, the caller has talked about both surgery and hormonal control of, of endometriosis. But I think what's, what's uh, an interesting development in endometriosis is not focusing so much on the little implants of the disease, but trying to more globally think about pain um, and that, uh, that uh, trying to look at um, various kinds of, of other therapies like physical therapy, like acupuncture, like uh, uh, pain medication uh, uh, that uh, resets the nerves so that there's not uh, nerve-related pain. So I think there's a lot of interesting research going on in the field, uh, but we still deserve better options than are there right now, just like we do for fibroids. Yeah. Thanks for calling in, Melody. You know, Dr. Stewart, I I think um, we're all interested in the younger woman that might have fibroids and to talk about that we could give them relief with the ability to still um, have children. That That's a key uh, issue, and that was one of the key issues in the survey we recently um, uh, published is that women uh, want to preserve their uterus because childbearing is important. And there's also a group of women who want to preserve their uterus even if they're not interested right. in future childbearing. But I think that's why we've got to change our thinking from just developing better treatments to understanding the disease and developing prevention strategies. Because as women now uh, don't have their kids in their 20s, they go to law Later. school, they go to yeah, medical school, school. They, they
they uh, spend uh, time on their careers, we need to be able to give them the option to have their families in their 30s and 40s uh, without having to um, undergo a hysterectomy in the meantime. And I know that now they're doing robotic surgery for GYN. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not only robotic um, hysterectomy, which a lot of people are aware of, but also robotic myomectomies, a removal mm -hmm. of fibroids with uh, preservation of the uterus. So that's also an option that women should be aware of. And, and minimal scarring. Absolutely. I think that um, uh, we're hoping to understand the diversity of disease. And one of the key research findings over the last couple of years is that not all fibroids grow. Many fibroids shrink. And if we can try to understand which ones are going to shrink uh, and um, concentrate only on those that are going to grow, that would be a big step forward. It would. I want to thank you, Dr. Elizabeth Stewart from the Mayo Clinic for joining us today. It's been a very good conversation about fibroids and your survey is very eye-opening, and we hope to have you on again. We're going to take a break right now. Thanks for joining us.